You've been so good and you keep on blessing me Everything that I have Everything, everything that I scripture for us. We're in Romans chapter number eight this morning, and I hope that you'll follow along carefully as we examine the book of God. I want to just read verse number 28 and get that to be in your minds as we investigate together. The book of God says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. These are familiar words. They are off-quoted words. They are encouraging words. They are exhorting words. Yet, they are often misunderstood words. Uh, the promise is often spoken of out of context. As the Spirit guided Paul's thoughts, he conveyed a comprehensive view of life. The veil of heaven is somehow rolled back in this text, giving us a glimpse into the reality of what's really happening in this world. And so for the next few minutes, allow me to lead you to see the promise of God and the prerequisites for this promise. You see, there are some things stated ahead of our text verse. And there are some things that Paul said ahead of that that require our attention. We want the promise of the good, but we need to know the requirements for experiencing the good. And so let me for the next few minutes use as a topic for goodness sake, for goodness sake. And normally when you hear that, that's said in a sense of exasperation. Somebody's gotten tired of somebody. Somebody's gotten tired of something. Yeah. And they say, for goodness sake, yeah. will you cut it out? Yeah. But I'm using it in a little different way. Yeah. I'm talking about in order to receive the goodness. Yeah. That's what I mean when I say, for goodness sake. Yeah. And when we look at this text of scripture, we got to understand what the good is. Right. That Greek word agathos is an interesting word. It refers to something that is good in its character and constitution, and therefore it is beneficial in its effect. Right. It's something that is good in and of itself. Right. So when you take it or when it is used, it has a positive effect. Right. It is good as evaluated by what it does. Right. It is good as evaluated by the end result. Let me share with you that there are various ways in which we can understand this word good. First of all, there is bodily good. Right. They say that milk does a body good. Right. Exercise does a body good. Right. Proper nutrition does a body good. Yeah. That's good in that context. Right. But then there is revolutionary good. Right. The late great John Lewis talked about good trouble. Uh, Black Lives Matter yeah. is looking and seeking societal good for Africa's distant children. Yeah, sure. Protests for equal justice are designed to make America good. Yeah, sure. I'm not so concerned about making America great because I don't think America was ever great. Not for my people anyway. Not for the Chinese people that were Chinese Americans during World War II. And not for many other uh, minorities. And so I'm not all wrapped around the pole of making America great. I'll be satisfied to make it good. Good for everybody. If we can get it good, then we have a good chance. But then we must understand that not everything that is good is pleasant in the process. All right, come on, right. The good is not always pleasant in the process. Right. Castor oil may not have tasted good, right. uh, but the end result was good. Right. Discipline yeah. 
didn't make us feel good. But the end result of getting it is good. And as God troubles the waters of America, and that's what he's doing, it doesn't feel good, but the end result can be good. And so when we talk about for goodness sake, we're talking about being able to get good from God, for he says all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. But then as we go on a little bit further in this focus this morning, this text is focused on good in the sense of our final end. This text is talking about the sum total of all of our time-bound experiences. This text is talking about the fact that what happens along the road of life as shaped by God for the good from heaven's perspective. This is talking about the idea that God is surely working, mixing, arranging everything that happens in our lives together to bring us to the ultimate good, and that is our eternal salvation. We have to understand that when it comes to this good we're talking about, we're not talking about necessarily a new house. We're not talking about a new wardrobe. We're not even talking about a vaccine for Rona. We're not talking about things that have to do squarely with this life. But we're talking about the good that God is working out of the things you and I go through from an eschatological standpoint. God says, I'm mixing all this stuff together so that in the end, you will be able to feast on milk and honey. In the end, you will be able to have a mansion, a robe, and a crown. In the end, you will be able to say there's no more death, no more tears, no more sorrow. In the end, you can't walk down and see the streets of gold. In the end, you can have everything that you really need, and that is your life with me. All things working together for good. That's what God is doing, and he's doing it for goodness sake. However, if we are going to claim this promise of Romans 8 and 28 and experience the good, there are some things that we need to be engaged in. We've got to be a certain kind of people. Don't take this verse and bank on it if you and I are not a certain kind of people. Only by being a certain kind of people can we apply this promise to our lives. Well, what kind of people must we be in order to have the good in our lives? First of all, we need to be a spirit following people. Right. I want you to notice your Bible in the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 8 where the apostle Paul is talking about following the spirit. One of the things I want to pull out is one of these verses in here where Paul talks about actually the whole 11 verses. He talks about following after the spirit. Right. We must be a spirit following people. Right. We must realize and remember that life for us is really about spiritual warfare. Amen. Life for us is really about a spiritual battle. Yes, We're around here today going crazy in America, uh -huh. talking about all the protests, yeah. talking about all this rampant disease, infection of COVID, states yeah. going up over and over again, some needing to go backwards from where they were, yeah. people out of work in Congress and fighting over whether or not $600 should be allocated to people. Yeah. We're fighting about the presidency and how is Biden going to get Trump out of the White House, fighting over all all these types of things, voter suppression, violence in the street, all these things are concerning us and we think about flesh and blood but I want you to know what's really happening here is a spiritual warfare. This is what we are dealing with. When we are baptized into Christ, we enter into the fray of spiritual warfare. It is a battle from within and a battle from without. Not all the battle is taking place from evil people doing things to us. Some of the battle is taking place from the evil within us that needs to be dealt with. The forces of this prince of this world attacks our minds with the goal of enslaving us to a God-forsaken mindset. 
where we start living in ideas that are anti-God, anti-Holy Spirit, and anti-Christ. This is the kind of world that we're dealing with, and this is why. If we're going to have the good, we must be spirit following people. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood or against principalities against powers against the rulers of darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places the devil is trying to mix us up in our lives and try to get us caught up fighting stuff and forget the fact that we are fighting things we can't see don't just fight what you can see Amen. Fight the power behind what you can see. Amen. We hear that song, you remember it, fight the powers yes. that be. Yes. You need to fight the right kind of power. Yes. The power isn't a corrupt policeman. The power is the prince of this world. The power is not a corrupt president. The power is the prince of this world. The power is not unemployment. The power is the force behind it. we got to recognize that we need to follow the spirit to fight the battle that we're in. As Paul goes on a little further, we got to understand what the devil does. He works in the mind. Yeah. Too many of us are looking for a red suit yeah. and some pinch, pinch fork uh, uh, hands and, yeah. and the idea of a tail yeah. and horns out of a head. That's too many of us are looking for that. Right. But what the devil does is work on the mind. Yes, he, he works on the mind in various ways. Yeah. The devil tells us that there is no such thing as absolute objective truth. On, the devil tells us that we got to have my, uh, our mind so strong and we have so much rationalistic power that we can figure it all out by ourselves. On, the devil has our world twisted, yeah. turned upside down. Yeah, oh, he uses a man who's died now, died in the 19th century right. by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche. This guy was a German philosopher, and he said stuff like this. Why am I bringing it up now? The man's been dead a long time ago, but his ideas are still impacting today. That man had the idea, and he said, you have your way, I have my way. As for the right way, the correct way, the only way, it does not exist. That's what he had to say. He went on to say there are no facts only interpretations. That's what he had to say. He had to say, is man merely a mistake of God's or is God merely a mistake of man? That's the attitude he had. And it's because of his type of thinking that the devil put in his head that we are living in the 21st century in an era of do it any way you want to do it. Somebody thought that song came out in the 70s. That song's still playing here in the 2000s. Do it any way you want to do it. Let me come with this song. Maybe you know this one better. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. I can't tell you who to sock it to. It's your thing. That's what the world is talking about today. They grabbed that stuff from a man like Nietzsche who got his thinking from the devil himself. And we need to understand that's what's impacting our society. This is what's impacting our society in the realm of morals and ethics. This is why you got people showing up on television commercials talking about Truvada. You can still be gay. You can still be a lesbian. You can be a transgender. You can be a bisexual. You can do all this stuff. Just take this little pill and it'll take away the danger. And people say, that sounds good. I want to keep on doing my thing. I want to do it with Charlie and my name is Paul. I want to do it with Sally and my name is Sue. I don't know what I am, but wherever I feel like doing it, I'm going to do it. And all this stuff comes from an attitude that says there is no absolute truth when Jesus says I am the truth I am the way I am the life don't you let foolish people take away your mind 
God has the right way. We have this attitude of doing your own thing when it comes to politics. That's how we ended up in the situation we're in right now. Too many people let their own hatred of the fact that we had a black president vote for just any old body to get in the White House, and now they got a nerve to be trying to justify the unjustifiable just for the sake of saying it's my thing. I want to do like I want to do. We have this craziness even when it comes to gender identification. Here's a man who says, I don't feel like a man. I feel like a man, a woman trapped in a man's body. Here's a woman saying, I don't feel like a woman. I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. And we got these operations that folk are going to take to switch up what God made in the first place. You need to stay in a pair of pants if you were born with the right stuff. You need to stay in a dress if you were born with the right stuff. Don't let me get more explicit, but I think you understand what I'm talking about. Don't try to change up what God made you in the first place. Be satisfied with what God did and stop trying to get back in the kitchen of creation and change around what God did in the first place. We got this same foolishness taking place in the realm even of religion where people are saying it's my thing I can do what I want to do and this is the kind of craziness that we have with folks saying I'm going to start a church and act like the Bible doesn't exist I'm going to preach a word but not the written word given once to the saints I'm going to give some prophecy and never heard of Daniel Isaiah never heard of Nehemiah and some of the other great people of the scriptures and yet Talk about I'm going to start a church. You can't start nothing without the book of God being your God and being your direction. And so then we need to understand that we've got to be spirit-led people because we are dealing with spiritual warfare. You can't fight this battle by going down to Planet Fitness and lifting 500 pounds on a deadlift. You can't fight this battle by getting on the leg machine and going through 100 repetitions. You can't build enough bicep and tricep. You can't do enough crunches, run enough miles on the treadmill or bicycle and fight this kind of battle. This kind of battle requires put on the whole arm of God. Be sitting in the spirit. This is the idea of having the good. If you want to have the good, you got to be a spirit-led person. The one that the Apostle Paul went on to say, he said, for those who live according to the flesh, as he went on, he talked about, we cannot be the kind of people that will be successful in this battle. Those who live by the flesh put their mind on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the spirit with things of the spirit. To be carnally minded is death. To, and to be carnal minded is to be enmity against God. The Bible is letting us know that if we're going to win and have the good, we've got to be spirit-led people. Because it's only by the spirit that we can distinguish between God's wisdom and man's foolishness. Only by the spirit can we determine between the morals of man and uh, God's purity. Only by the Spirit can we determine the difference between God's righteousness and man's injustice. So for goodness sake, we've got to be Spirit-led people. But then there's something else that we need if we're going to have all things work together for good. If we're going to have the good in our lives, not only do we need to be Spirit-led people, but we need to be flesh-killing people. Yes. All right, brother. Yes. Bible is letting us know in these verses, prior to verse number 28, that we've got to learn to kill the flesh. Yes, the Bible talks about this in Romans 8 and verse number 13. Right. For if you live according to the flesh, right. you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What are we talking about when we talk about the flesh? We're talking about sin, loving nature. We're talking about an attitude. We're talking about a mindset. You and I have to admit that we're not all that in a bag of chips. We have to admit that no matter how many church services we've gone to, we have to admit that how many times we've uh, done good deeds, none of that stops us from being exempt 
from a battle against our flesh. What is our flesh? It's the part of us that still wants to do the stuff we used to do. It's the part of us that still has its tongue wagging whenever the devil puts something out there that catches our attention. I get tired of cocky Christians who walk around like they've never had a bad day, like they have already got their wings and floating up in heaven. That they're already down here just so we can watch them and be uh, following their example because they're so pure and they're so powerful. You ought to quit lying to yourself. Every one of us is subject to our flesh. The part of us that still wants to cuss and does cuss when things don't go our way. The part of us that still wants us to drop our pants or lift our dress in a bed we got no business in. You don't have to say amen. I know it's right. The part of us that still wants to get five finger discounts. The part of us that still wants to watch late, 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 late night Cinemax and see stuff we got no business seeing. The part of us that is still jealous and envious when somebody gets something nice, all of a sudden we got a problem with it. And we weren't even thinking about it, but because they got it, now we get mad. The part of us that still acts the fool whenever we feel like acting the fool, that is our flesh. And if we're going to have goodness, we've got to learn to kill the flesh, the God opposing mindset, the God rejecting spirit. Paul says, if we live by our flesh, we will die. He makes it very plain. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit put a cord in the meter here, too many folk walking around talking about all I need is to read the Bible and I can follow it perfectly. You ought to quit lying to yourself. No man or woman can simply just read the Bible and thereby be perfect. If that were the case, why did my Savior come to earth? He had to come because he knew I was toe up from the floor up. He had to do something on the inside of me because the outside only won't get the job done. And so he had to give me forgiveness of sins in the water of baptism. But he didn't leave me there on my own. He knew that I needed some power on the inside. He gave me the Holy Spirit and the Spirit helps me as I live day by day because the spirit sees those fleshly thoughts coming in my mind and the spirit says, ah, I got to put on the brake. I remember when I was learning how to drive, Brother Terry, I was in one of those driver's ed classes. You know those cars that have brakes on both sides? Some of you know what I'm talking about. I remember driving that car and the guy would say, you're doing all right. I remember how I did all right all week long and it got to the point where he said, I'm not going to even test you for anything further. I know you got this thing. You have already passed. I was still in the car with them when he said that, and I got so excited that I turned the corner too fast, almost hit oncoming traffic, but he pushed that brake, and it caught the car out of the way. He looked at me like, fool, are you crazy? And I want to tell you that the Holy Spirit has to push the brake in the car even today because I might be driving down the road having a good week thinking that I'm doing all right. I've overcome things that I hadn't overcome before. I'm driving fast. I'm driving strong. But you get a little too excited, a little too cocky, and then a thought comes in your head and makes you speed and turn into oncoming sin. And the Spirit says, Stop the break! Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he looks over at me, so to speak, and says, Don't be a fool. We need the power on the inside because if we are not following the Spirit, we will not kill the flesh. You and I must kill the flesh if we're going to have good in our lives. And then when we look at this thing a little further, we got to understand for a Christian to habitually live by sin-loving domination is for that Christian to be on his or her way to eternal damnation. Put a quarter in the meter here. We got to understand that once saved, always saved was never written by the apostles. 
never spoken by Jesus. Certainly didn't come down from heaven. Once saved, always saved is a nice idea, but you have to understand the Bible teaches something different than that. For a Christian to continually stay in the lane of following his or her flesh and purposely keep doing the wrong thing is for that person to be lost. That's a danger I see with the popularized Christianityism of today. It's the emphasis on God's condemning nature when it comes to people who are serving the flesh. We got too many individuals who believe in the love of God, but they forget about the severity of God. They talk about the grace of God, but they forget about the judgment of God. We've got too many people who are erecting churches in the sense of people and building up great numbers because they preach a wrathless God. God says you can do anything you want so long as you do a good deed no that's not what the scriptures teach too many are going down this path of saying that I'm a friend of God we love God he loves us but we forget that in order to be a friend of God it requires obedience it was Jesus who said you are my friends if you do whatever I command you to do Jesus never said I'm going to just love you and you keep doing anything you want I know it's popular and I know it builds up great numbers, but we have to remember experiencing the good is a function of obedience. We cannot continue to sin that grace may abound. Too many are following a celebration of grace, overshadowing the call to obedience. There's no amount of good deeds we can do to allow God to overlook willful sin. Somewhere I read if we keep on sinning, Uh after we have tasted and been a part of the grace of the Lord, there's no more sacrifice for sin. Jesus is not coming back to die for hard-headed us because we won't stop sinning. And so then when we look at this, for goodness sake, let us be flesh-killing people. Thank God we have the spirit to help us to kill the flesh. But then there's something else I want to share with you. If we're going to experience the good, we must be a Christ-shared suffering people. This comes to us in the latter part before we get to our text. In Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17, Paul says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. Watch this now. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. If we're going to have all things work together for good, We've got to be a Christ-shared suffering people. Why would Jesus suffer? Why did he suffer in this world? He was suffering because he was living in hostile territory. The Lord knew when he was here, he wasn't in his own territory. He knew that he was in the devil's territory. Sometimes we talk about sports, and I'm glad some of them are back on again right now. When we talk about sports, sometimes they talk about the home field advantage. They talk about the 12th man. They talk about that crowd that is always jeering the opponent. And sometimes the home team derives motivation and more strength because even though they have the same amount of players, they got the crowd behind them. And the crowd gets in the minds of the opponent. Sometime in basketball, old LeBron gets up to the foul line to take a foul shot. But he's in somebody else's arena. And all the fans are up there right behind the basket waving all kinds of things and boo and hiss and miss and all of that. And sometimes he clanks it because the crowd got to him. Jesus knew that he was in enemy territory. He knew he was behind enemy lines. And he knew the power of the prince of this world. And therefore, he knew that he had to suffer. And if Jesus suffered down here, guess what's going to happen to you and me? We got to suffer in this life. He knew, and we must know, that this world for us 
is again a place of spiritual warfare. Yeah. No wonder the Lord said in John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, if the world hates you, yeah. you know that it hated me before it hated you. Yeah. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the, that's good stuff. He chose us out of the world. He chose us from among everybody else, shared the gospel with us through a human vessel. We responded to the gospel that showed us being picked out of this world, even though we are still here. And we have to be people that share in his suffering because Jesus said, if the world hated me, Philip, why are you upset? Because it hates you. Amen. Serving it not above his master. Amen. The student is not above his teacher. Right. You can be like your teacher, which means if they hated him without a cause, what do you think gonna happen on your job? Amen. What do you think gonna happen in your neighborhood? Up, what do you think gonna even happen in your home? Right. If you follow Jesus and the rest of those rascals don't, right. this is the way it is in this life. And because we are in this life and because we've been chosen by Christ, if we're going to have goodness, we got to recognize we got to share in his sufferings. Right. However, remember this church, if we suffer with Christ, We'll be glorified with Christ. If you read back in Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about how we are recognized children of God. We can call him daddy, Abba father. Why? Because we are part of his family. God chose us by adoption through the obedience of the gospel. He put us in the same household as Jesus Christ. He gives the son great blessing. He's going to give us yes, great blessing. Yes. Jesus suffered in this life. We must suffer in this life. But the end of the suffering has a better picture. And not only do we suffer here, but you need to understand what's happening in this world. The whole world is suffering and not just us. Amen. If you read very carefully here in Romans chapter number eight, Paul talks about in poetic language how creation itself is suffering because sin has messed up this world so bad. Why is there racial hate? Sin has come into this fallen world. Why is there social injustice? Sin has come into this world. Why is there murder? Sin has come into this world. Why is the government so corrupt? Sin has come into this world. There are people who think that, oh, well, somebody just was educated wrongly. No, there's a deeper problem than that. The prince of this world operates in the minds of men and women. This is spiritual warfare, and you and I suffer because we see that the way of God is right. We've been unplugged from the matrix, and we see the prince of this world coming after us in various forms because he knows that we must suffer with Christ. But if we suffer with Christ, we'll be glorified with Christ. One of these days, one of these days we'll be able to be glorified with Christ. I get tired in this world because of the suffering from within when without. I get tired of fighting my own demons sometimes because I have to suffer in this world. But I've got to keep on going. I get tired of having to deal with people who inflict punishment on me. And for no reason at all, but I have to suffer because Jesus suffered. I get weak in this world because of the suffering that I have to undergo. I get weary in this world because of the suffering that I have to undergo. And it's not just me. It's for everybody who names the name of Christ. But thank God Almighty, one of these days, the suffering will all be over. We'll be able to be glorified with the Lord. So for goodness sake, let us be Christ shared Suffering people, which brings me to the end of the message because it brings me to where I started, where the Bible says we know that all things work together for good Amen. to those who love the Lord, who are called according to his calling. Brother Terry, I know you've been through a rough 72 past hours. I know there's been some tears shed. Yes, yes. I know there's been some fear. Yeah. I know it because I've been down that path myself. Yes, I know there's been some anxious yes. moments. Yes. I know there's been some pain. Yes. I know there's been some anxiety and some sorrow. But 
if you suffer in this life. Jesus says, I'll work it all together for good. It doesn't matter how dark may be the night. Joy comes in the morning. Why? Because God works it together for good. Brother Philip, I know you've had some suffering in this world. Yes, trying to deal with job situations. Yes, trying to deal with struggles up, down, all around, side to side. I know it's hard to be a young man trying to live for the Lord. Especially when you got these fast tail young ladies after you. Trying to get in your pants when you're trying to live for the Lord. I understand how they want to get your money and leave you hanging dry. I understand that. But if you suffer with Christ, you'll be able to have a victory. Brother Willie, I know you had some bad health problems a few years back until up to the almost recent day. I know that you were suffering from pain and affliction. I know you were in and out of the hospital and having all types of struggle and angst and wondering where it was going to end up. But God took all that and mixed it together for good. And here you are here at the building at Westview even doing some jumping jacks. Here's a man who knows what some suffering is. Brother and Sister Stone, I know you You've had some battles in this world trying to raise a child in a crazy world. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But thank God, God takes it and mixes it all together for good. Brother Sidney, I know you had some problems in this world. Struggling with trying to make sure the children are okay. Trying to make sure you keep doing the right thing. But God takes it all and mixes it up together for good. Brother Lonzo, I know you had some struggles in this world. World. Having to move from D.C. down here. Having a problem keeping a job down here. Having to move back to D.C. trying to get back home. to get close to an ailing set of parents. But God worked it all together for good. And now here you are in Hunts, Vegas, Alabama. Brother Greg, I know you had some struggles in this world. Having to deal with people on your job who act like they got no doggone sense. Having to struggle with the ups and downs of people who get jealous of you. Trying to stop you from making the money you ought to be making. Especially with so much time and experience. But God is taking it all. Mixing it up for good. Bless you. I know we're tired of being apart. We can't come together. We can't hug. We can't fist bump. We can't sing together in person. We can't eat our meals in the back. We can't have children's church. We can't do the various things we want to do as Rona is messing up the world. But God is even taking Rona and making it all come together for good. Yes, there are times when I think about my mama's kitchen. Mama will be 88 years old tomorrow. Mama can still burn in the kitchen. Mama's still beautiful. Mama's still sharp in the mind. Mama's still bold. Because when I said I was coming home, she said, you can't come home right now. I'll whip y'all back to all the other Mama, I watched her in the kitchen and I watched her make a cake one day. Yeah. Brother Phillips, she was using some Hershey's chocolate. Yeah. And I thought it was a regular Hershey's chocolate bar. It was that bitter chocolate. And when she took that flour and took that vanilla extract and took all the other ingredients and mixed it all in there, I said, Mama, I want a piece of that chocolate. I said it so much. She said, boy, get from under my feet. She got tired of me. She said, here, go on and eat a piece. I put it in my mouth. It was the worst thing I ever tasted. Why? She took that same chocolate, put it in in the mix, yeah. mixed it all up and put that thing in the oven when it came out. It was a delicious chocolate cake. I'm telling you, God's got a kitchen like nobody else's kitchen. All your disappointments, all your pain, all your struggle, all your loss, all your time in this world that is hard. God is mixing that thing up together. He mixed it better than the candy man. He mixed it all up and it comes out of the oven and it tastes so good. And one of these days I'm going to be at the banquet table and the cake of my life with all the mixed up ingredients that were terrible tasting by themselves when they set that cake before me. I'm going to say I don't know about that Lord. He's going to say go on dig in because it's all good right now. For goodness sake God is working in our lives. And so good keep on blessing me.